Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Teal, and I'm the Interim Assistant Curator of Programs here at WICMA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual series of Curatorial Close Looks. And I'm especially thrilled to introduce today's program featuring Elizabeth Sandoval, Curator of Embodied Words, Reading in Medieval Christian Visual Culture and in conversation with the show's collaborator and Williams's Chapin librarian, Anne Peel. Um, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that my colleagues and I are presenting to you today from the campus of Williams College, which stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of this region now called Williamstown, Massachusetts. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. As we come together today, we pay honor and respect to their ancestors, both past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable future for all. And as always, we encourage all of you joining us from your respective regions to find out more about the indigenous peoples of your own areas. Now, before I turn it over to our wonderful presenters, I have just a few logistical notes. Um, today's conversation will run just about one hour, and we will be taking audience questions during the second half of the program, but we welcome you to send your questions to us at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your navigation tool. If you have any questions or need any assistance throughout the program, please do send those questions or requests along through the chat and our staff will do their best to assist you. Live captioning is also available during this program and can be turned on or off through the live transcript button at the bottom of your navigation bar as well. That button is the one with the CC on it. And this presentation today is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the museum's website and our YouTube page. Now I am delighted to turn things over to Elizabeth and Anne to introduce themselves and the exhibition. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Teal. So I'm Elizabeth. It's very nice to meet you um, all virtually. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I am the curatorial assistant at WICMA, and I'm also for this year the acting assistant director of the graduate program in the history of art. And please. Thank you folks all for being here and thank you Teal so much for that introduction and to WICMA for hosting this program. I'm the Chapin librarian here at Williams and I carry our rare books and manuscripts collection in the libraries. Um, so I think the first order of business today, Elizabeth is going to tell us a little bit more about the process of curating the exhibition and about some of the works in it. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and Elizabeth will jump right in. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that, for collaborating, uh, for joining this program, and for sharing your screen. So this is a collection installation. Um, thank you. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, mostly a collection installation, that is. Uh, if you come and visit, and I hope you all do, um, please, you will be able to see 23 artworks in here, six of which are loans from the Chapin Library. Uh, so these are works from WICMA and from Chapin, which are telling a new story. Um, now, even though there are 23 works, they're coming from so many different countries. So present day Netherlands, which is both the Netherlands and Belgium, from France, from Spain, from Italy, Germany, what is now Germany, and the United Kingdom. And these artworks date from the 12th through the 16th century. And one idea that was circulating at that time is the idea that our bodies are not independent and closed entities, but rather we breathe each other in. So we take in what we speak to each other, what we sing, um, as well as other bodily excretions and even and smells. So people depended on each other for physical uh, subsistence, but also spiritual nourishment. They were very careful about who they spoke to, what they saw, um, and what they said. Ideas of, re of reading are rooted in those general, more general ideas. Um, people believe that words could literally imprint on your souls, on your heart, and on your minds. They could change your soul and your internal composition, and they could even determine whether you were condemned at the end of your life or saved. Um, so in these centuries, people were taking ideas from antiquity, such as Plato's idea that the mind 
is like a wax tablet on which the words could be inscribed into our memory. Um, and yet, despite the caution, words were everywhere. So they could be on chimney mantel pieces, they were on paintings and sculpture, they were embroidered on clothing, people had tattoos, um, they were in jewelry, and of course they were in books. Um, so the purpose of this exhibition is ideally to surprise people and how words were everywhere and um, how these reading practices continue to influence us um, and also to make us contemplate how we read today. Um, some of this didn't, only, so words were not confined to the pages of a book. They could be, it could be body language and gestures, just like we read today. So I'm going to walk us through a virtual tour of this exhibition. Um, and we're gonna do this by going through, exploring the six themes that, that reflect the idea of embodied reading. Next slide, please, Anne. So in the corners of most of the slides, you'll see an installation shot, and then you'll see close up images of these objects. So here on the right, we see a choir stall um, be behind which monks would have sat or stood um, while looking together as a group at large books, such as the antiphonary, which is on the left. Uh, so an antiphonary is a collection of antiphons or songs that were used during the liturgy. And this book is huge. Uh, so in the early Middle Ages, so even though this book is from the 14th century, uh, it's, it's showing, it's reflecting how reading was communal, uh, especially in the early Middle Ages, when reading was done orally to a group. So one person would be reading and people would be listening, especially at monasteries or um, uh, abbeys and uh, comments. Um, but we would we will be seeing a variety of sizes. Not all books are this majestic. Uh, so let's talk about how this is embodied. Well, first of all, of course, people would have been touching it. They would have they would have turned the pages uh, as the monks would have sung. Uh, but also, the words wouldn't have been so. Imagine a large group seeing this book from a distance. They likely had memorized all the words and some of those features such as the initial that we see here or the red rubrics which are um, the writing in red which would tell us this is a new section or this is um, like something explaining that it's a new chapter or sometimes not often saying I am the person who wrote this so it's it's like our chapter headings today something marking there's a difference um, so either the rubrication or the initial and also marginal decoration would serve as memory devices to tell people, okay, this is what you should be singing at this point. But they might not have been reading it uh, word by word. They would have memorized some of that, the, the content. They also would have been singing and singing was a form of, of, of reading. And something that we don't, don't see here, but please do come and see, we also have a bell. And bells would have been rung and that would have signaled to people, okay, it's time to turn the page and um, sing or read this section now. Um, another perhaps surprising sense that was involved in reading was taste. So in the early Middle Ages, monks were said to mysticulate and chew on passages from the Bible in order to understand them. Um, next slide, please, Anne. And that will lead us to the idea that becomes adopted in the later Middle Ages. So this is a book of ours, uh, which is much smaller. It is in the exhibition. People would have held this in their hand like precious jewel, and they would have used it to pray something between seven to nine times a day. Uh, and it is very elaborate. They, we can see that there's gold and even lapis lazuli in the blue robe of God who's enthroned in the main miniature, the main image of this book. Um, so these books were, as I said, they were used for prayer, but they were also signs of wealth. Um, in this case, we know that whoever was reading it at one point um, licked their fingers and then licked the initial, which you can see on the right, the detail of that. Um, you can even see traces of a fingerprint because they're licking and rubbing away the image in the, the initial here. Uh, so that was pretty common to, to lick as a form of devotion. Often 
the figures that are licked away are Christ or the Virgin. So this is a particularly interesting case uh, because the figure in the initial could be a portrait of the donor himself or herself, or it could be a saint. It could be somebody who was known to the person holding the book. So I do hope that this show also challenges us to think about reading, even reading inside a book more expansively. Next slide, please, Anne. We also see how manuscript uh, decoration would have inspired other forms of artworks. So these are two capitals, uh, which were in two different um, places. Uh, fortunately, we know the location of the one on the right. Um, but let's talk briefly first about the one on the left. So you see in the roundel that there's a face and it's the prophet Isaiah. And this roundel perhaps was inspired by initials and manuscripts because on the other sides, we see floral decoration and it's, it's vegetal, uh, you see leaves, but then when you are seeing it in person, walk around it as much as possible, you'll see that it's on a pilaster, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and you also see shepherds with what is perhaps a sheepdog uh, on another side. So that's why it's interpreted as being Isaiah who in the Old Testament was said to prophesy uh, the coming of God or Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Um, so the shepherds would have been going to see the nativity of the Christ. Um, on the right, we see hybrid creatures and we'll often see such hybrid or even grotesque features, uh, figures and creatures in marginal decoration and manuscripts. Here, this would have been a column um, that monks would have been passing by, one of many above many columns, uh, this, excuse me, this capital, and they would have used it perhaps to signal to them by, by the time you reach this, this column under this capital, you should be saying this particular prayer, or it could have been protective, apotropaic, because these creatures aren't known. Next slide, please, Anne. Now, gender was a big issue. Gender determined who could read, write, um, hold books, have access to books. Um, and it's very interesting that what is reflected in these images isn't necessarily accurate to what was the case in the Middle Ages. So on the left, we have St. Mark, who is writing the, the gospel, his gospel. Um, we see that he's at a desk. And there are two open books, but he has, he has even more books um, there with him. In his hand, he's holding, in his left hand, he's holding, well, in each hand, he's holding an instrument. It's, it's unclear which is which, but one is probably a knife, and another one is either a stylus, just like we see here, uh, there's the third image uh, with the white background, or a quill, both of which would have been used to write. The knife would have been used to cut a quill tip because they become dull, um, but it's also used to hold down the parchment leaf because parchment is the writing support and that's animal skin. It could come from, anim from cows or sheep, goats, um, various kinds of animals. So the knife could have held that down while he's writing. Um, it also would have been used to scratch out ink if he made a mistake and he wants to write over. Um, where he made a mistake. Now, we, if we look to the middle, we see an Annunciation scene in which the Virgin is being visited by Angel Gabriel and being asked if she would like to be the mother of God. She also sits in front of a desk and there are multiple books, but she does not have a knife, a quill, or an ink pot um, because women were not, at least in Northern Europe, were not represented as creators of texts. They were consumers, but not creators. And it's very interesting because these are both from books of ours, uh, which for the most part were owned by women. They were smaller. And they were also used in reality for moms to teach children how to read. Um, and so, and women would have known how to write. They just wouldn't have been represented as creators and writers. Uh, and we see uh, the last image we see is a stylus. And uh, as I said, it would have been used to write, but it also was com um, compared to a phallus. So even the ideas of writing were considered more masculine. Next slide, please, Anne. 
Now, as you're touring around this small gallery, you also see that writing was both in and on objects. And in, in this case, we have two paintings. Uh, and because of the wonders of, of Zoom, we can see them up close. And please do see them up close when you're in person, but you'll see the different scale and reality in the installation shot um, just to the right. Now, in each case, there's a man that's holding up text, uh, but it's, and it's text that we can read, but it's, uh, ha they have a different relationship to the text. So on the left, we have Isaiah again, as we saw in the Capitol. And he's reading a verse that he wrote um, in Latin, Ecce virgo concipiet et pariet filium, which means, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. So he was supposed to have prophesied, prophesied that uh, a virgin would give birth to a god who in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, is interpreted as Jesus Christ. And this text is on a huge parchment leaf that he's reading from. It's interesting because the reader would have seen, would see it, would be able to identify, to read it if they could read Latin. Um, and it's broken up. So it implies that the reader would have had familiarity with this passage and would have known that this was a, that this must be Isaiah because this passage comes from Isaiah. On the right, we have another passage, um, but this is a prayer. I apologize. Uh, so on the right, we have a passage which is a prayer to be said to Anthony Abbott, it's very clearly displayed across the two uh, pages of his text, and it would have been a prayer said on his feast day, and he's telling the reader, say this in front of this painting, say it to me, pray to me, whereas the passage on the left, if the reader were to say it, in some way it's as if they are embodying Isaiah. So in our fifth theme, fifth out of six, we have the placement of our bodies in relation to paintings. One thing that's really interesting to consider is that artists were really aware of where they wanted people to stand when they're looking at uh, particular objects. And they knew that we get fidgety. They knew that we would move our, keep our bodies in the same position, but move our, our heads or our shoulders. So this is a triptych that you can see in the from the installation shot um, that is displayed with the wings slightly at an angle, which would have been accurate to how it was displayed at the time. And it's a small altarpiece, essentially, that would have been in a home. Um, and the two, in this, what's represented is the passion of, of Christ. So it's Christ on his way to be crucified at Golgotha. So he is represented multiple times. And so your eyes are journeying through. It's like you're taking a visual pilgrimage along with Christ. Uh, your body is staying in the same place, but there's a lot of... Um, movement mentally spiritually happening um, you're moving along with him and his disciples up um, and even past his crucifixion to when he releases the souls in limbo um, let's get a close-up look and we're going to see how this artist thank you Ian, is going to try to interact with us so as i said he's represented in multiple places there are only three places here in which um, which I've identified for the sake of time, but he's praying on the far left. In the middle is actually where he's, on the very top is where he gets crucified, but then on the far right is where he's releasing the souls from limbo. In some cases, he's actually looking at the viewer. Now, my interpretation, and I welcome you all to go and, and challenge this, is that he knows that, that you're, you're, the viewer is standing in the center and you're turning your head to see Christ. So he's interacting with you. It's not, uh, but see if this is true. Can you be in a different location? Is he still looking at you if you move, uh, if you move around perhaps? Um, see what other depictions of Christ there are in which he's also looking at us to see what, where the artist wanted us to stand. This is only one painting, uh, and I'm only really talking about a few examples of each theme, but please do go and see if this is the case with other works, and also see if the themes work with other works. But now we're going to our very last theme. So next slide, please, Anne. And this is the theme of artists as readers. So in this image, for example, we have this beautiful woodwork of showing the Dermission of the Virgin. 
So the Bible doesn't talk about the virgin dying uh, and going to heaven and doesn't talk about her, um, what happens to her exactly. So there are many stories that came up uh, that were developed about what happened to her body and to her soul. Um, this depiction probably comes from the Golden Legend, which was a collection of stories of saints. And it was very popular. It was developed in the 13th century. Um, and in this in this story of the Dormition of the Virgin, Mary sleeps and her soul um, and Christ comes while the disciples are all around her and he collects her soul and takes her, assumes her in, up into heaven. So we see that some of the disciples have books that are open. Um, many books were um, devoted to the art of dying and they were, they collect, they contained prayers said specifically uh, with before a person who was passing away. Oh, excuse me. So what is really cool is that we actually do, the Chapin has a golden legend collection that's from the 14th century. And the label here for this artwork invites you to go and to see it at Chapin. It is not in the exhibition, but you could go and actually hold it um, in Chapin Library. So before, I would like to conclude with just a few points. Uh, you may have noticed that the color of the light of the exhibition is red. And that is it's three for a threefold purpose. One is because of the rubrication that I mentioned in when we were looking at the antiphonary, uh, the red from the books telling us this is what you should be doing now, or this is a new section. Um, so this red picks that red up. It also picks up the red in certain many artworks. So it ties the manuscripts and the artworks together. But finally, because we're talking about embodiment, it's, um, it's the color of blood and blood is universal. So that is also hopefully making us think about our bodies and who we are, uh, what we're doing when we're reading. Um, now I will invite Teal and Anne back on to this virtual stage to join me for a discussion and questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that wonderful tour. Um, yes, please do go see the show in person if you can. Um, it's just even more magnanimous in, 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 in real life and in space. Um, I have so many questions. I just want to also remind our audience to please send in your questions through the Q&A, and we will <laughs> work them into our conversation. Um, but maybe to start, I'd love to for both of you, this is a question for both of you, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the process of collaborating between the library and the museum. The show, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, has not only objects from Wickma's collection, but a number of beautiful manuscripts from Chapin. Um, and it's such a, it's such a wonderful opportunity for these two institutions on campus to come together. And we'd love to hear more about that process. Would you like to start, Anne? Or Whatever. Sure. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I think that Elizabeth first reached out to me all the way back last November about this show. And that that gives you some sense. And, and at that point, she was already well into the planning process. So that gives you some sense of the, the scope and the time scale on which WICMA works on these exhibitions and plans in advance. Um, so Elizabeth reached out to me initially with a request just to see the manuscripts that WICMA has on deposit here at the Chapin Library. Um, the Chapin has for many years stored about five of WICMA's codex manuscripts, a codex being something that has covers and pages, what we would normally think of as a book. Um, and we keep them here and WICMA generously allows us to use them in teaching and in, in, in class sessions on a very regular basis. So Elizabeth wrote to me saying, could I see the WICMA manuscripts, please? And I, I wrote back saying, yes, of course, come over anytime. But also, would you like to see some of the Chapin manuscripts? Um, and I think that one of the things that neither of us really realized was how many of the manuscripts of the Chapin's collections would be relevant to Elizabeth's show. Chapin has about 40 pre-modern European manuscript codices. So pre-modern thinking, you know, roughly our, our rough quad off date is about 1600. Um, and it's, it's just a tremendous wealth of material. We use them all the time in teaching and in research here in the reading room, but they don't see a lot of long-term exhibition the way that they're going to in this show. And they don't see 
as many members of the public in the exhibits that we're able to mount here and the teaching that we're able to do here. Um, so it's just been really, really exciting to work with Elizabeth um, and to, to sort of go through the process of making those manuscripts accessible to her and thinking about um, which ones would be best in this show. So I'll let her speak to some of the process of, of winnowing down those 45 or so manuscripts to choose from just to the, the handful that are in this show. Thank you, Ann. I can't believe it was November when we, when we first started working on this. Uh, so I, I definitely wanted to see what was in Wickma's collection. So Wickma has you know, a limited amount of manuscripts, but and one of them is in the exhibition. Um, so I, and there were some topics that I was thinking about for this show. And one of them certainly, they were all going to include, you know, manuscripts to some degree, but um, I remember talking to Anne about some of these topics and she's just so knowledgeable about the collection that she would say, we also have these and we have these and we have these. So it was such an exciting time. Uh, mostly it was on Fridays, I think that I would go and visit. Uh, and they were so generous. They had, they had a cart and I would get to keep them on the cart while I was still paging through each one. Um, and, and we would talk, it was, uh, we would talk about what, you know, what could work, what uh, wouldn't work. And some of my favorite memories were going with Anne, just, uh, she would just so generously give of her time. And we would go through to the vault and we would look at the special books and we would look at all, uh, where uh, other, no, so not just the vault, but also other areas in Chapin to go see what books there were in there. Uh, Chapin has so many for uh, books that were printed on parchment. And we have one of those in the show. Um, I, I would have put in many more, but this gallery isn't very big. So I had to, I had to be very selective. Um, and it really helped to have, um, and this was also the thing. So I, I'm very grateful that an exhibition is not just one person. It's completely collaborative. I'm so grateful to everybody at, at WICMA and the help. Um, in different ways for this exhibition. Um, and Kevin Murphy helped me, who is the uh, curator of American art um, and medieval and European art at WICMA, helped me to really pinpoint what the theme was for this show. And so that's how, that, that, through many discussions, so that's how we were able to decide these works work together well, they're in dialogue. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, maybe to sort of pick up on the on the conversation around process and development, I know that in preparation for this show, you both conducted a lot of research on objects featured in the show. And I was wondering if you could maybe share with us some of new the new discoveries you may have made about objects um, that perhaps we've both seen, um, we being the audience, objects we might be familiar with and objects that may not have um, previously been shown as frequently before that may be newer to some of those of us visiting the um, visiting the galleries. Would you like to share first, Dan? I know I've talked a lot. Oh, gosh. Um, there are so many things that came out of this research process and the collaborative process of selecting works for the exhibition. Um, Chapin keeps records of our manuscripts just the way that Wickma keeps records of their artworks. Um, Chapin has about 100,000 rare books, not to mention um, everything else in the collection, manuscripts, archival material. And that volume of books, sorry, when I say Chapin, I meant special collections at Williams, um, which also includes the college archives and the college special collections. But with that volume of material at our disposal, it can be really hard to make time to really look closely at any one object unless we know that we're about to use it in research or in teaching. And so it was an incredible privilege to work with Elizabeth over a period of months and really just take that time to look closely, to examine, to consider the kinds of questions that might arise from the public when they were looking at these materials and how those questions might be both similar to what we might ask of our students in a class session, but also quite different. Um, so one of the things that came up actually was a question about the binding of the antiphonary, the, the very large choral book that we were talking about earlier. And actually, if I can, I'll just skip back to that slide so that we can all look at it together. Um, 
And what you're not seeing in the, the coral book as it's displayed open is the really amazing binding that it has. Uh, it's The binding is of heavy, heavy leather. It has two leather straps that attach around the cover to pins on the opposite board to hold it shut when it's not open. Um, and it also has large, what are called metal bosses. Um, they fall into a category called furniture actually, which is attached to the book and designed to keep that leather from being in direct contact with the shelf below it. Um, and, and all of this binding material is really impressive and it looks really old when you look at it. You say, ah, oh, yes, this is an old binding. But one of the questions that arose is how old is the binding and is that binding contemporary with the pages inside of it? Um, and you know, we had a look and we kind of looked, we looked at the type of furniture, we looked at comparable bindings that we had in the collection. And then we looked at the texture of the leather. And the leather itself has an incised pattern on it that has to do with the way the leather was actually produced. Um, and, and the pattern is called diced Russia. It's, it's just a way of describing that particular leather texture. Um, and, and as far as we knew, diced Russia was not really a medieval thing technologically. And so um, Elizabeth very kindly suggested that we might consult some experts from other institutions about this binding, whether we could say the binding was contemporary with the pages or whether it wasn't. Um, so we took some photos, we emailed out to a list of rare book professionals, and we got a response actually from the, the scholar who is probably most knowledgeable about the history of book binding in the whole world. And, and this was just a tremendous thing to have happen. And he said, well, you know, he can't be a hundred percent sure because he's not physically with the book, he lives in England. Um, but judging from the pictures, he agreed that Diced Russia really is an 18th century innovation. And so what we're probably looking at with this manuscript is we're looking at a rebinding or at least a recovering of the original style of binding. And so it's done quote unquote to style as a librarian would say, um, but it's probably not actually contemporary with the pages. So that's a great example of research that emerged as we were getting ready to, to host this exhibition. Um, and that probably we would never have taken the time to do or really thought to do if the book had just been used in classes as it has been for so many years. All right, that's me talking a lot. So off to Elizabeth. No, you're not talking a lot and you're being very generous. I think it was you who came up with the idea. Let's reach out and uh, I'm pretty positive. See what, if we can date this binding. Um, let's see, I'm gonna talk about a few objects that have come to mind. Um, one of them might be the golden legend that I mentioned earlier. And I was, I mean, it was, it was potentially going to be in the exhibition, but it didn't make it uh, because it, it, isn't, it doesn't have any images. So it wasn't going to be in, in as fruitful a dialogue with the other objects, but it is still there to be seen. Um, we also, I was also hoping to display a terracotta virgin, which may have been part of an Annunciation scene, but when we saw it, it, it would have worked so beautifully with the Isaiah images that we have, um, but it's in unstable condition. So it's something that we noted, oh, this we need to, um, it's not ready to be exhibited, but we can take care of it now. And, and maybe at some point it will be exhibited. Um, so there are obviously some works that didn't make it on it to this, to this version of the show. And we also are for the first time exhibiting this wonderful Spanish panel. And would you please move to the slide previous, the installation shot, the large one. Oh, thank you very much. So that large panel, uh, we were donated uh, it um, by, by Anima and Paul Katz in 2019. So it was um, it's the first time that we're exhibiting it and uh, certainly uh, won't be the last, but um, it was great to do research on this really fun piece because um, I found out that it was it's one piece of what would have been part of a ceiling. So it's a ceiling coffer and it would have been joined with so many others that look like this. We don't know what the scenes are exactly, but it, they're courtly scenes. Um, there's one scene with two hybrid creatures that are uh, whose necks are intertwined with each other. Um, there's one of a man and a woman in the middle vignette. And on the far left, there's uh, what, what may be a man on a horse killing some kind of beast. So they are courtly scenes. Um, what we know is that it, where it came from, it came from the Palace Curiel de los Ajos in Valladolid in Spain. Uh, and we know that minstrels would have 
and other presenters would have been invited into this palace where, where the host would have entertained his guests because the minstrels and um, proleptors would have told stories and they would have reenacted whatever stories it is that these um, ceiling coffers were depicting. So there, this particular piece of wood would have you know, originally been displayed with a lot of music and, and um, dancing. And now it's here in this exhibition. Thank you both for that. Um, I love that panel. I think it's one of my favorite works in the show. And Elizabeth, you mentioned that there are works that couldn't make it into the show uh, for various reasons, including their delicate state. Um, but we also know that given the fragility of certain objects in the show now, that they will have to be rotated out. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what you're thinking of in terms of those future upcoming rotations, um, how they will relate to the current themes, maybe expand upon certain uh, themes within the show and yeah, just what we can look forward to as the show continues on. I'm happy to start, but Anne, please pop in at any time. Um, so, so they are, so manuscripts can't be, you know, open and exhibited for, for longer than three months because they are so fragile and that's what keeps their colors so prime and their pigments um, intact. So every three months, we'll be flipping the leaves, um, which are pages in manuscript um, for most of the books, except for one, which is um, in, it's fragmented. And so we can only flip it once. And, and then it'll, so it'll be on display for six months. So there will be other, something else that will take the place of this. And after 12 months, um, we, we'll be in more discussions before that, but and I will, we'll talk about other works that can take the place of all of these manuscripts. Um, let's see. So one example, one theme that will be coming up is how we've, we, we well, I, I was mentioned, I was talking about gender. So gender will continue to be a theme for, for example, um, but instead of us focusing on annunciation images and images of um, evangelists, we'll have, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll, we'll display images of patrons that are inside these books. So, and often they're women. So it would, might be a woman who is kneeling in front of a crucifixion. Um, so she is looking on to Christ and the Virgin, or she's near them in some, some way. Uh, and so patrons, especially for books of ours, uh, would, would pay to have themselves represented as a form of saying, you know, to God, don't forget that I am very devout. Remember me at the moment of my death, uh, especially if it's like before crucifixion. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, so these are all, these, these books of ours and manuscripts were so costly that they weren't only devout, the devotional um, tools, but they were also kind of a way to show off your wealth and um, to impress your friends. So that's one, one way that we'll be changing and rotating works. Absolutely. And one of the wonderful things about changing out those works is that we have so many others to choose from and we're able to share so much of the collection with a wider public. Um, what I would also add to Elizabeth's comment is that this gallery is a little bit challenging to work in physically because it's one of the few at WICMA that actually gets some natural light through those really wonderful stained glass windows that are opposite the image of St. Anthony Abbott that you see here. And so one of the considerations as we were planning the show was to think about the light levels in the gallery and to think about what kind of time exposure and what kind of material we could show in this space. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice is that all of the manuscripts that are being exhibited are on parchment. Now, paper is invented in China um, before the year 1000, as early as I think 800 or so. Um, and paper comes to Europe as early as the 11th century. Paper making is established in Europe in the 12th century. And so at the time when all of these works are being produced, paper is available to people who are writing on surfaces in Europe but we're not able to exhibit paper in this gallery right now because it's even more sensitive to light than parchment is. And it's really just not safe for us to be showing it long-term in this space. Um, WICMA exhibits works on paper in lots of other galleries. And we hope someday to be able to show some of our paper manuscripts and some of our paper printed books. Um, but really in this space, it's just, it's just not right for this space. 
And the amazing thing about um, parchment is that not only is it available as a writing surface, but it's actually available if you're being very fussy with your printing press. One can actually use a printing press to print on parchment. And so the book of hours that Elizabeth referred to briefly um, was, was printed, not written by hand as a manuscript, but actually printed in Europe um, at the very start of the 16th century. So we're really, really excited to have that book present as well. Um, and if you want to see more books of ours, if you see, want to see more printing on parchment, you're very much welcome to come to the special collections anytime we're open Monday through Friday and take a closer look at any of those other books and manuscripts that we're referring to here. I'm going to piggyback on what Ann said. So uh, Ann mentioned this or while we were working on this show. Um, so at Wickmo, we can't touch the books. They're also, they're in cases, but at taping, you can actually touch, you can go and see them up close. It's just so special. Um, and also, uh, I forgot to mention, so Anne was talking so beautifully about the, the binding, uh, and Brian Repetto, who's an amazing chief preparator, um, thank you, Brian, he created this special case and support for that book, so you can peek around and see the, the binding and the furniture that Anne was mentioning. You can see the straps um, just under the front cover, so please do come and see all around it. Thank you both. I was going to note too, um, just when you were speaking to the, the challenges and the specificities of working in, in Blashfield, that just the way that the show is curated is, is so wonderful because there's, there's so much in a relatively small space, but it really does invite you into this kind of ambulatory circular mode of, of viewership that I think is really nice that um, is not always the case in every gallery. So kudos to you, Elizabeth. It's it's a beautifully put together show, um, and also there's so much um, so much information on all of the works, or not all of the works, on many of the works. Um, and maybe to that end, could you tell us a little bit about some of the works that maybe don't have as um, don't have their own individual wall labels, don't have as much written about them in the show, but certainly we know you both have um, tremendous knowledge on. Maybe what are your favorites, if, if you can pick them? Oh, thank you, Anne. Um, so yeah, so there are seven works that don't have labels. And I, I met with an undergraduate group and a graduate group and some uh, um, Elijah from the undergraduate group said that he assumed that the ones that didn't have labels were meant to, to challenge us to have an embodied form of reading right there in the gallery. Um, I mean, some, some of it is logistical, like they, you know, time is a very important matter when creating an exhibition. So um, when, so, so some just didn't get labels because perhaps they were, their connection to embodied reading was perhaps more, um, well, they, they were able to ex explain it themselves. Um, and there will, when we change the works, we're also gonna be changing the labels and adding new ones, et cetera. Um, but um, I did mention, so I did uh, in this, I took the opportunity of this being recorded because uh, to talk about some of the works that didn't have labels. So for example, the capital that has the hybrid creatures doesn't have a label currently. Um, yes, and, and I mentioned the bell, we have a bell in there and that doesn't have a label but it also has writing around it. So, um, so I was hoping that maybe that would, would, would be one of the ones that people would say, oh, I see the connection with this show. I'll pass it on to Anne to talk about any others. Sure. Um, I would say that Elizabeth's labels do a really wonderful job of connecting the content of the books and, and especially the very minute details of the illuminations and all of those very particular aspects that are shown opening by opening um, to the theme of the exhibition and, and really draws viewers in to those very specific things that might not be obvious to someone who was paging through the book in a reading room environment. They might not take the time to do that close looking at just one single page in the way that you must in an exhibition where it's not possible to do that page turning. Um, and I guess in terms of things that don't have labels, 
as a librarian, it was really interesting to watch the process of Elizabeth writing these labels and considering what should go in and what shouldn't go in. Um, because the way that we catalog books in a library format is, is in some ways quite different. It tends to be very much about the text that's included in one of these manuscripts. It tends very much to be about um, any specific provenance that we have. So where the manuscript was before it was here at Williams, who bought and sold it over the years and what that can tell us about its history, about where it might have been made, about who it might have influenced. Um, and our, our catalog records include things like subject headings that are meant to use very controlled vocabularies to link particular types of information to each other. So in other words, in a library catalog, there will be a clickable link that says, I want to see theoretically all manuscripts or all books in the library that are about Christian legends, um, for, for example, the golden legend, or a clickable link to say, I want to see all Bibles. Um, and that's the sort of thing that in an exhibition environment, the, the labels simply don't do and choose not to do. Um, but it's, it's also a wonderful way where someone who was interested in learning more about any of these objects could go either to the library catalog for the books and manuscripts um, or to WICMA's own digital catalog and, and search these individual objects and learn a little bit more about them. Thank you both so much. Um, we're just about coming to time. Um, so. I wanna leave it to you both to say any maybe last words you have, but so grateful to you both for being here this afternoon and for sharing your wisdom with us. The show is so beautiful again, Elizabeth. Um, and I hope everyone who is on here and who will watch this afterwards gets a chance to see it in person. Just thank you so much again, Teal, for, for hosting and being part of this conversation. Thank you to Elizabeth for really amazing curatorial work. And also to all of the other staff at WICMA and across the college who made this exhibit possible. It really takes a, a huge team to bring together a bunch of work like this. Um, and, and we're really grateful for all of the folks who contributed to make that happen. Yes, thank you, Teal, for, for planning this, for your calm voice. Thank you, Ian Kennedy, for working behind the scenes and making this work. Thank you, Anne Peel, because this has been such a great journey and it's it's not the end. We'll continue to work together. So thank you for wonderful discussions. Um, thank you, Pam Franks, for suggesting that I create this installation, um, that I work on this. Um, There's so many people I would want to thank. Thank you, Lisa Doran, so I, uh, for looking at the labels and walking me through each step of the process. Um, thank you to Kevin again. Thank you to Rebecca for looking at the labels. Um, continually to make sure that they were okay. Um, so you thank you to Nick and Claire who were my interns who helped to do so much research for the show months before uh, a year. It's been, it's been years that I've been thinking about what to put in that gallery. Um, and to the audience, thank you all for joining us. And I, um, I hope that there are some um, links and some little teases that will make you draw you into the gallery and look at these works up close um, to make your own discoveries about what reading was then and what reading is now for you. That's a perfect note to leave it on. Thank you both again and thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>